Dubesar, you can start now giving introduction. Okay. So, good morning, friends. Uh, I'm very happy to announce that uh, today we have Mr. Javier Rodriguez as our speaker. Uh, first of all, I want to extend a very warm welcome to Javier and also want to thank him for very kindly accepting our invitation to speak, to speak before this group. Javier is going to talk to us on the art of living, seeing, listening, and learning in daily life. Uh, Javier doesn't need any introduction in this group, nor in any Kismuthi circle anywhere in the world. But for some of us who are going to listen to him for the first time, I'll briefly introduce Javier to the group. Javier comes originally from Spain. In his mid-teens, he came across the work of Krishji and was instantly struck by its wholeness and ring of truth. From 75 to 78, Javier was a student at Brockwood Park School, the school Krishji founded in England in 1969. After completing a BA in Humanities and an MA in Spanish Language and Literature in the US, he returned to Brockwood Park as a teacher in 1990. There he met up with Christie's close collaborator, Dr. David Bohm, and actively engaged with him in the exploration of the letter's dialogue proposal. Javier spent two years from 1993 to 1995 as a resident scholar at KFI headquarters in Chennai, Vasant Bihar, and on his return to Spain, he conducted a K-inspired inquiry group, translated several books of Krishni into Spanish, and became a trustee of the Spanish Foundation, which was which is responsible for dissemination of Krishni's work in the Hispanic-speaking world. He also joined Krishmuti Link International, an informal group of former Brockwood staff members brought together by the German industrialist Frederick Grohe, who was Kay's close friend during the last two years of his life and a lifelong financial supporter of Krishmuti institutions worldwide. Javier was, Javier was one of the main editors of KLI's magazine, The Link, which served as an international forum for the study of the teachings. In the year 2000, Javier moved to the Netherlands, where he has been residing ever since. He has been collaborating with the Dutch Krishmuti Committee and continues to be associated with KLI. KF, KLI. He is presently the editor of Frederick Goe's newsletter and is active in KLI's international network of activities. In 2016, Javier started giving a course offering a comprehensive introduction to Krishna's life and teachings. The idea of this course stems from a sense that they are universal in nature and a potential avenue of significant insight and fundamental change. As such, he feels they deserve the closest study as well as widest dissemination for they are a veritable education for mankind. Uh, with these words, I just want to mention that Javier is offering a course on Kismuthi's teaching, which is online. And uh, I have already given the, the website. You can log in on to and if, if you are interested in being a part of that course. With these words, I welcome Javier once again and uh, request him to please begin his lecture. Javier. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Dubey, um, for the invitation and all of you uh, for the invitation to share once more. Um, it's a bit early for me, <laughs> so I hope I'm lucid enough <laughs> to be able to go into this subtle topic that we have for today. Um, it's uh, 6.40 here instead of 11, uh, something over there, 10 or so. So it is a bit early for me. 
So we have the topic of the art of living and seeing and listening and learning in daily life. And as you know, that was kind of the beginning of Krishnamurti's the foundation. Krishnamurti tried to set the foundation of his teachings, um, the way he expressed it. This is how I work with his work, which is I try to see how Krishnamurti developed his whole approach to the human condition and his necessary transformation. And uh, the talk where I drew the kind of perspective that he had in, in his teachings is the second talk in the Sri Lanka, in Colombo, Sri Lanka in 1980, which was published as a little booklet called The Book of Life. There, Kay very beautifully describes this book, <laughs> which is not a book, of course, it's just us and our lives and the way we live, the way consciousness is structured and how we can approach it as uh, how we can approach it and learn from it and uh, in the process of learning transform ourselves and he starts basically what I would I might call before he gets into the subject matter he has a kind of introduction to the art of reading if we don't know how to read we will not be able to learn anything from this book so we have to know how to read and that's the first and last problem really do we know how to perceive do we understand what it, do we do we see do we listen to begin with look at it we don't even see or listen properly so how are we going to read this book so he begins with what i call the introduction which is this one the art of living the art of living has been used by many people. It's used everywhere, this expression nowadays. I don't know who came up with it, but in K, it has a very specific and very encompassing meaning because he does address living and is not having to do with any particular aspect of it. But curiously enough, that art of living is centered on perception, is centered on how we see, how we listen, and therefore how we learn the art of living as he described it has four other arts as far as i could tell four other arts involved which are the art of seeing the art of listening the art of learning but also the art of thinking together the art of thinking together he called by different names at different times like the art of questioning um, the art of yeah, communication but basically the art of dialogue even. So those four seem to be the pillars of what he called the art of living. But the art of living is actually wholesome because living is the whole of what we do, encompasses every single activity. And the word art has a specific encompassing meaning as well in K. It's not painting or anything like that. It has to do with as he defined it, as you know, the word art for him has the meaning of putting everything <clears throat> in his right place. So art has a, 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 a meaning of order. But as you know, art itself is not is a mechanical process. It's something that has to do with creative and a creative approach. At least that's how art is understood generally, right? The art of doing anything has to do with order, precision, skill in action, but also the quickness of perception that allows one to stay up, keep up with the facts as they change. So it's not a formula. It's not something that has been learned from before. It's not therefore necessarily a technique, though it may include it. It's something that has to be up to the dynamic, everlastingly changing movement of existence. And life, for K, as you know, is relationship. Relationship with things, with people, with nature, with ideas, with oneself interiorly as well, as well. So all that being in order is what is understood by the art of living. As you can see, that's a lot. 
<laughs> it has a, a huge amount of things. Look at what happens, what relationship implies, right? Just human relationship with each other is very complex, right? And yet that very relationship, beautifully enough, is the field in which we are reflected and in which if we know how to look, if we know how to listen, there is therefore a learning process about ourselves. This is an odd thing about being human, isn't it? That we somehow are developed, have developed collectively a kind of ignorance, a kind of blindness to ourselves. We don't understand how this consciousness has come to be this way. And the way consciousness has structured itself and continues to operate makes for disorder, which means it's not artistic, it's not sensitive. So disorder is one of the first things we meet. This is part of the challenge of being artist of living, which is what the first thing we meet is disorder, basically. So the art of learning is learning about this quality of disorder that consciousness itself brings to bear on our relationships. As you can see, through our relationship with things is messed up. We use things not because we need them necessarily, though that is part of it. We live in a world of things. We need things, but we use them not necessarily already for the fundamental needs that we have of food, clothes, shelter, and so on, but to create status for ourselves. We give them status, a value that we that they don't have in themselves. So we build, we use them to create, build our own self-importance. <clears throat> and in the process, we create inequality, we exploit people, and we create a world of injustice, violence, and so on. This is part of it, the wrong attribution of values. So right there, we have an enormous thing to look at if we were to explore that. That's one chapter in itself, the whole issue of disorder in our existence, right? That's a great chapter in the book of life. Then the, 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 the relationship with nature, you see where we are at. It's very difficult at the moment, right? Because we have destroyed it so badly and we are exploiting it, even continue to exploit it. And we don't know how to stop. We don't want to stop. We see the danger, we are on the cliff, and we continue carrying on. That's not order, that's absolute disorder. So we are going, we have developed in this way, human relationships, look how bad they are. Uh, is, there, is there even a quality of, of harmony in our homes and between neighbors and between nations, between groups, castes, you name it. There is a tension almost everywhere between one human being and another, men, women, different uh, orientations, races, beliefs, political inclinations, all that is fragmentation. Right? And inwardly, we're also fragmented. There is the conscious, there's the unconscious, there's one desire against another. So the general panorama of human existence, when one looks at it, and K is very good at describing all those different layers and domains of fragmentation does indicate that we are not artists in the sense we are not artists of living because our life is in disorder and art means to put everything in its right place so that's the big challenge that mankind has with itself and that's why learning the art of living is so fundamental because in principle if we were good artists of living we would begin to put things in the right place. Our relationship with everything, therefore, would be in order. But what would make for that order? And what is the essence of this art? Hmm. So Kay says, the essence of the art of living is perception. If we see things rightly, correctly, factually, he assumes, and we have to question it as well, because he places a lot of emphasis on perception that if there is right perception, there will be right action. There will be therefore right relationship and things will fall naturally into place. So the first step for him is the last step, which is if we perceive correctly, rightly, 
accurately, truthfully, then we are also truthful, accurate, and correct in our actions and relationships. Our values are therefore also in place. We do not exploit, we do not use, we do not create this very fragmentation. We do not contribute to the fragmentation. The fragmentation can be ended right at the beginning. This is what he takes to be the very ground of order, the very ground and beginning and end of setting the ground of order, which for him was virtue. So to lead a virtuous, righteous life had to do with this very movement of perception from moment to moment in, in accuracy. But there we have already the fundamental issue. Do we see? Do we listen? Do we learn, therefore, in that sense of actually perceiving accurately what is? That's how learning takes place. Right? Learning has many meanings. It's not just from books, it's from life. That's what we're talking about. And then can we communicate also with the same quality of clarity and perceptiveness so that there is no dispute between us? Because that's a major issue, right? The whole issue of dialogue has to do with this, as to how we communicate. Right? and how it is that in communication we continue to perpetuate the quality of divisiveness and fragmentation that ever permeates everything else. It's just an expression of the same condition that we human beings seem to be stuck in. So what is the seeing that Krishnamurti and listening Krishnamurti is talking about? How do I see? Do I see? Or do I see what I, is already in my mind? Right? He calls it, is there the mind? What is the mind? Do we see with the mind? Do we see with consciousness? Do we see with memory? Do we see with desire what we want, what we expect? We see with fear. We see with self-interest. Or we see with our eyes. We see with the direct perception of things with no self-interest, with no intervention of the consciousness as knowledge. So there already there is something key, critical in terms of the engagement with reality and actually the shaping of reality that results from this, where we look from, how we approach the world. What's our relationship with it is determined by this act of perception. Is there where the whole thing plays out? So how do I look? This is the first and last step according to K. The first and last freedom. Talking about freedom from the whole condition of fragmentation. That must be a fundamental freedom, wouldn't it? If I'm stuck in fragmentation, then I'm stuck in conflict. I'm stuck, therefore, in a movement of violence and sorrow, of grief, of pain. Either I inflict it or I'm, uh, it's inflicted upon me. I'm actually a victim or a victimizer. That's no way to live. That's certainly not orderly. That's not virtuous. We're contributing to a world of sorrow that's not the ethical approach. That's not even living, if you like. That's what undermines the meaning of living. People may justify it, right? According to evolution, is the survival of the fittest. And therefore, we just go on our brutal ways about it. Because what matters is us to survive as a group, as an individual, climb the ladder and all that. But that neglects the whole meaning of existence. Existence is meaningless when conflict undermines it so thoroughly. The meaning of existence lies in the artistic way of living, in the orderly, virtuous, and free, and wholesome, therefore, because it's not fragmented. This is what we're asking of ourselves. It's not just K. It's something that humanity has called for since time began. Since mankind became aware that something had gone wrong with us, that we had taken a wrong turn, that we were ourselves, therefore, responsible totally 
for what for our own fate. We could no longer trust, you know, attribute it to the gods. It was our own consciousness that developed a mistake in itself, and to undo it seems to be the challenge that has remained with us since time began. There's where we are at. K says, yes. You see, the Krishnamurti's teachings are based on the premise, if you like. There's no premises, of course, in K, but on the perception that mankind needs to change. Otherwise, it's going to destroy itself, and not just itself, but the world with it. Now that, you see, the extinctions are already happening, massive. So we are responsible for that. When you see this, you realize that it's you. That it's just not me and you only, but the whole of us, the whole lot. No longer divided by nations, by beliefs, by anything. This is part of the great universal challenge. And that's playing out in our daily lives. There's no other, other what do you call it, stage in which this is happening. The theater of our daily lives is where this is playing out, right? So that's our challenge. We have to therefore see if we can understand why this consciousness is acting so contrary to its own interests, because we all want the good. And yet we operate from such motives that we bring about exactly the opposite. It's an incoherent mode of existence. That is quintessential, a quintessential example of ignorance. You act in such a way that you intend something and you get exactly the opposite results. We all mean to be, to secure our existence, safety and so on, even peace. And we prepare for war and we destroy each other in the process. That's not coherent, that's not consistent, that's not humane. So there we are, he says, there is a way in which this can be altered. The course, whole course of human history can be altered because consciousness can be changed. And it can be changed by an insight into its very structure. But for that, there has to be a sustained quality of awareness, of perception in daily life, such that that reality is revealed. If we come to it already with conclusions, it won't reveal itself. So that's the first thing. We're all full of conclusions. One of the first things, anyway. We're full of conclusions about things. We have inherited all kinds of doctrines, all kinds of visions, all kinds of philosophical, religious outlooks, political outlooks. And none of those have yet yielded the real answer. The real answer is not in any of these ideas, however seemingly coherent or helpful they might be. There is no idea yet, because the idea doesn't get to the point. There has to be an actual perception inwardly of what is happening. But we can also begin to see it outwardly, because relationship is the mirror, is the, where we express ourselves, where that consciousness is at work. Consciousness is not just something hidden. It's something that manifests. And it manifests in our daily lives in relation to each other and to everything else, like we said. So can we see it there? So what is seeing? <clears throat> Case starts there. And essentially, I think he says, if you know how to see, you've done your work. <laughs> now, that's very helpful, very hopeful, isn't it? That there is a very simple act, supposedly, is the cure all, the panacea <laughs> for all our human problems. So we should put a, lot, a bit of energy into this. <laughs> See, lots of energy is put into medicine and psychology and uh, all other pol politics, but somehow into seeing we don't put too much energy. Whereas, according to the wise, this is where the whole so problem can be solved. The solution lies here. If I can see you and therefore not come to you with a prejudice or my wife or my child or anybody or myself, if there is a quality of intimate contact, that is no division, then we've solved our problem. It's as simple as that. It sounds almost too simplistic. That if we found a way of living, of perceiving, of responding, therefore from accurate perception, the division is dissolved and conflict is ended because conflict is our first and foremost problem. There's no other problem. <laughs> I 
Of course, there are problems of <clears throat> how to produce enough food and how to create shelter and education and all that. Yes, all those we can, and we can solve all those still <laughs> with 800 million <laughs> people in the world. <laughs> And India about to overtake China. <laughs> we have still a lot of we have a lot of problems. So we have to also take care of those. No question. But you know, with the right mentality, with the right compassionate, intelligent, cooperative attitude, we can even now at this late a, sta, stage of the world, with all the <laughs> overpopulation and all that, we can still solve them. Right? So a problem number uno <laughs> is this division and conflict. And Krishnamurti says you can end it right there in the act of perception. And that, that act, it can be instant. So there is not even time involved. That is radical, isn't it? That there can be a perception, instant perception, which does not require any methodology, any time in, interval, any technique, any, even any, any kind of what you call it, determination. Now, this is radical <clears throat> because most of our problems, we take it that way. We have to do something and we have to get somewhere and we have to solve this issue and that issue. But the issue is right at the beginning, is in the action of perception every day. So this is, this is fundamental and worth listening to from K, listening to K in that regard, because if at the source, <clears throat> we, can, we can solve the issue at the source, then there is no river of conflict. There's no stream of division and conflict. There's no stream of sorrow. I don't know if that's sinking a little bit, if I'm, I'm trying to even assimilate in myself as I'm speaking of, of how radical that is. Huh? The sense of, hey, if you look without, because there is a negative element as well in this, without that quality of self-centeredness, of me here and you there, of my conclusions, my beliefs, my ideas, my opinions, my experiences, the interest that I have in all this, the identity that I have built and on which I base my sense of meaning, security, becoming meaning of life. In fact, I get tribute to all this content of consciousness. That consciousness itself, by the fact of being in the past and of the past, is in a, in a sen essentially irrelevant to the act of perception and the act of relationship. Because relationship is action, right? It's all action, reaction. But if I react from a limited place, then the likelihood is that I will divide. And if, in me, if, I'm, if I'm in the past anyway, I'm missing something. <laughs> I'm missing the essential element of the living quality of the moment, which is essentially creative and new. I miss the new by living in the old. That's also radical because it does away with all traditions, all beliefs, and therefore all identities derive from those traditions and those beliefs. It eliminates consciousness as the past at that level, at the level of perception. It may be relevant at other levels of knowledge and in terms of practicality. Without that knowledge, we couldn't also function very well and also with all the, the 800 million, we couldn't even survive. <laughs> so, all right, there is a relevance to knowledge. There's a relevance to time. And that's part of the art of living. We have to have knowledge, but we have to apply knowledge correctly. But the knowledge of the self seems to be a mistaken direction mankind has taken. When knowledge constitutes itself into a psychological identity, it distorts, divides, the very structure of relationship introduces division. This is the key. Therefore, disorder, therefore, no art, because things will be out of place. What is out of place is this consciousness in its intervention as a limited factor of knowledge in the field of perception and relationship. 
when I was a student at Brockwood, okay, he had this discussion with us. And I was rather shocked <laughs> by his saying that knowledge, thought, the past, consciousness in that sense, had no place in relationship. Now, I couldn't grasp that at all. <laughs> because it seemed to me that to relate to someone, you have to know them. And knowing someone is part of relationship. And anyway, you approach them, the first thing you do in an intimate relationship, for example, is to tell people your life. You tell them who you are by telling them your history. So there was time in it. There was knowledge. There was thought. And anyway, you have to remember them, you have to remember who they are, you have to know who, how to go there and so on, right? You're always exchanging knowledge. What is not knowledge? So I had a big problem with that saying, and it stuck with me for a long, long time. I said, I, that's very radical to say that knowledge has no place in relationship. See, this is, we're still talking about the art of living, huh? It was talking about life and what distorts it. This is what we are trying to inquire. Because if we bring that to order, then we have the art of living. Otherwise, this disorder is not art any longer. So one of the factors seems to be this. So to pay attention how early in the morning, like it is for me now, and you a little later, we are still operating from knowledge as we face each other. Knowledge is partly necessary, right? Like you gave an introduction about me. And I was listening to it, and I was saying, my goodness, that was me, <laughs> sort of thing, right? So you get an idea about this chap from the history that is the course of his event, the curriculum vitae, the kind of journey that he has made in connection with all that. But now here we are, see, we're already a step ahead of our own history, right? This present moment now is not encompassed by that history. It will turn into history as memory captures it and defines it and draws something from it. But this moment is essentially ahead, right? That's the beautiful, that's where we sort of were saying relationship takes place at this timeless moment. That the moment time comes in, is already confined it to a limited sphere of time. And therefore, the relationship can easily be broken by that very time. Because it has created a bubble, a kind of border between what was and what is. If we insist on what was, <clears throat> concepts of all kinds, identities of all sorts, then the division comes in. And conflict can arise. Generally, it does. Krishnamurti thought it was a law. Where there's division, there must be conflict. Do concepts divide? Certainly, at all kinds of levels. Do I separate myself from this instant now by bringing all my memories to bear on it? By keeping up uh, this whole stream of consciousness as self-centered movement of thought and feeling. My own interest above all. Isn't that how we operate? So we have to question how we operate in daily life. Are we even aware of anything? Or everything is determined from the, from the first moment I wake up to the last moment when I go to sleep. And during sleep, I go along. My consciousness is continuously busy with itself. Me is my primary object. Whatever concerns me, my interests, my pleasures, my fears, my ambitions, my security, my relationship with X, Y, and Z, which is not in order, what I want, what I don't want, what I expect, what I don't expect, my self-pity, my vanity, whatever it happens to be, that whole stream is very alive, it seems, in most of us. So to pay attention to that stream and to see how that stream is destroying our lives, because we don't have relationship. <clears throat> We don't have relationship. What's the That's why Krishnamurti would say things like, the essence of the art of living is the abandonment of the self. Because that self is the principle of isolation. But do we even see the self? 
right? Or do we judge it as well? We assume that the self is the observer. So there we have a massive little confusion. Which, who observes? If it's the me observing, then already we're not observing in the wholesome way that the art of living requires. Because it will distort it, it will create an isolation, a division, and therefore the friction that brings about disorder. So we have to question it as well. Is the self, this movement of self-interest, self-concern, not indeed at the heart of the disorder that we experience in our relationships at every level? So what does it mean to watch the self? Right? That's very interesting, see? Because, okay, I, was, I used to think, well, how do you even see that you are being selfish? Right? Is that just a concept or you really see it? You see it, you can see it. If somebody has something and you want it. <laughs> it's very simple. You have a piece of cake <laughs> and you don't have a piece of cake. But so you want that piece of cake. And if you are greedy enough and astute, then you may do something tricky to get a piece of cake for yourself. <laughs> you can get jealous, envious. It's as simple as that. And of course, then it builds up in society according to the structures of the world that we have nowadays, right? Here in the West, it's very clear. We have success, money, status, and success. They are the three pillars of society. And therefore, that's all comparative measurement. And you just go at it to see about gaining your rightful worth by fitting into those measures in the best way you can. Look at it. We're just conditioned to follow on this path of the competitive spirit because our own self lives, finds its meaning, its worth within that structure of comparison and measurement. And society sets the, the standards and you do your best to rise up to them so that you will gain or earn your rightful worth. See where we are at. And therefore we get trapped in that mouse trap, you see, that wheel of the ladder and so on. So that's the self. <laughs> it's not even myself. It's the self of society. Society is selfish because we're all selfish together, right? That's how it works. So can one deny that and see the, pr the problem and the danger of it? Or is one just too frightened not to, to look at it? And therefore one is just compelled because of this survival mechanism to continue along those lines. And can one say, no, this quality of competitiveness is dangerous. Therefore not compete. It comes from comparison. Therefore not compare. Right, the negative approach Kay talks about. If you see the danger of something, then you drop it. Do we do that? Right, from day to day, to the last syllable of recorded time, that we perceive the dangers of our ways and we drop them. Even if it is apparently dangerous to do so, right? It would seem dangerous to drop competition, comparison, the pursuit of success, because everybody is in that race. And the world is easily divided into winners and losers. You could be a loser, therefore, because you drop out of the race. And you don't compete anymore. And you don't pretend to be what you are not. You don't pretend anything. And you're really now concerned with the essence of mankind, with the essence of freedom, with the essence of wholeness. And therefore, you're keeping your eyes peeled for every single danger, for every sign of disorder and especially the disorder that comes from you. And the disorder that comes from you is the self-interest itself. That's the primary source of disorder. So to put that aside, is that possible even? Kay asks, right? So seeing. Now, I remember Kay at Brockwood was very keen that we start the day with 10 minutes of silence, some minutes of silence. So at Brockwood, we had the morning meeting. I believe in Rishi Valley, they have something similar. I think in the evening, uh, they sit and watch the sunset over Rishi Konda. So the sense of take a little time to stop, if you like, to look, to listen. 
That's, of course, a specialized little moment. It's not meant to be separate from the whole stream of daily life. Because this is where it's at, as we say. Daily life is our, the only life we have. So that's where the order or disorder is worked out. By the way we look, by the way we listen, by the way we think and feel. So to be quiet with oneself at the beginning of the day. So that consciousness develops a quality of self-awareness. Because that's what we are exactly missing. We don't see how consciousness works. It hides itself. We think that's us. That's our very nature. And we just have to follow this impulse, which has deep roots even in the animal, right? So we're just animals, cunning animals, like Kay says. <laughs> Careful with that. That's dangerous, right? At this level of sophistication to still remain cunning animals. So to observe. What is thought? What is thought doing? Why am I thinking these things? What am I feeling? So that opens up a space in which actual listening can take place, not always filtered by my self-concern. I can listen to the birds. I can watch the trees. I can then therefore watch another and listen to them in the same quality of warm, considerate concern. So the relationship is established. If I don't see, I don't relate. So just to see, to listen is so transformative. You can see it and it doesn't take any effort. There's no effort to see or to listen if one really sees the significance of it. And it's all instant. You know, if it happens to you that, you know, you wake up in the morning and you sort of are worried about X, X, Y, and Z issues that you have to resolve. But you look at the tree. You happen to have a tree <laughs> nearby. <laughs> or whatever you look at, you can even look at the wall. Look at anything. That very act of looking it, curiously enough, has a wholeness to it that is almost hard to find anywhere else. That's why artists are all profoundly involved with their art, because while they are doing their art, they just forget about everything. There is a kind of order there, right? But what we're saying is, can that order be brought to bear in the whole of life? Otherwise, art is not complete. It's not the art of living, it's the art of painting. But the painter has already that quality in relation to his painting, because he has to perceive and he has to, to, to capture, if he can, on canvas or whatever he does, that quality, same quality of intimate contact with something, which nourishes the sense of feeling, of beauty. Beauty comes through seeing. Look at that. And without beauty, our lives are a bit impoverished, to say the least. So beauty, order, art comes through there. Simple thing to do. And can that be carried out throughout the day? Because that's the ground of order. That's case suggestion. I'm not sure if I should go any longer because we're a bit, we're already gone a bit, a bit far. No, we need some time to talk. So maybe, okay, I, we can leave it there, maybe, and we can uh, discuss something further. There's more, of course, to it than I've said, but therefore, together, we can develop it much more. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Very clearly and simply put it. I already see a few raised hands. We'll go to Mr. Pradeep Verma. Yes, please unmute yourself. Okay. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. And very good morning. Huh. Today's topic, surprisingly, reading was missing. Seeing, listening, and learning. Reading was missing, but that you have covered beautifully right in the beginning of today's talk. What do you mean by reading, actually? That was a special reading you were talking about, the reading of oneself, myself right? 
but otherwise also generally speaking my experience is that reading books is also a good source of learning i am using books good source of learning first book i read about jk was mind of jay krishna murthy almost 50 years back so this was also like reading my book of life reading that book was like reading my book of life and you will find that invariably it is always i am always associated whatever i do whatever i read and whatever it book reading is an art by itself one can commune with words and enter a space they are indicating two words it's not possible to meet personally all your favorite authors books when read through self gives a very lively experience a process that can see and feel truth this is my experience then i am quoting from your one small book an overview of dialogue you see dialogue is a conversation between equals a very important topic dialogue is a conversation between equals the spirit of dialogue is one of free play a collective dance of the mind that becomes a continuing adventure opening the way it's to significant and creative change now this equals is a very complex condition although language and semantics plays a huge role in communication why i am raising these questions is because i feel very much concerned why the such an important message such an such a powerful message like jk's is not reaching those masses where they are required most like india and for which sensitivity your fourth player, pillar you have mentioned is the sensitivity for me this is the first pillar mm -hmm. not that i want to <laughs> create my image uh, create my image but this is what i feel if sensitivity is there then all the three pillars you have talked about in dialogues and uh, dealing with what dr bohm talked about so this is sensitivity and this sensitivity is inherent in man and that differs from man to man you see that's why the conditioning is so very different you have also talked about these things so these are certain points that came to my mind thank you very much if you can respond to these points thank you <laughs> there are so many points i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I would just be happy to let it be as your own description, which okay. you have made, of course. But learning from Isikar Ramuti used to say this thing about learning. The first thing about learning from books or learning from texts. Yes, we do certainly learn from those. I myself was contact with K was through a book, and uh, I felt instantly impacted by it. The sense that here was an authentic voice of truth in our time. A very hard thing to find, by the way. <laughs> it takes about 2,000 years before one of those comes around, <laughs> according to Christian measurements. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, we were very happy with, to be alive at that same time, you see. But what the question is, of course, of this reading of the Book of Life and what the reading means, it's a metaphor, right? So we do learn from books. But Kay always said, hey, you learn far more, far more from observation because we're talking about life, right? And the book will describe life, but life is happening right here and now. And there is a gap between the knowledge that we get versus what is happening. And do you know the difference, right? I think we all know the difference between actually seeing what is happening in our lives perceiving even the reality behind the words that we understand to be true, right? It's very different to say thought is limited and to perceive that it is. Or that I'm conditioned 
and I take that as a conclusion from the wise, and then seeing in daily life that I am conditioned, how that conditioning is playing out. So that is the thing, you see, that the real learning takes place there. What is it to learn? What does it mean that I learn? And I say, okay, I learned from Krishnamurti that thought is limited. Yes, but did I learn it in the sense of did I see it? What I learned really properly, what learning is, is perception. And not the concept may match the perception, but without the perception, the concept remains still a part of the duality in which we live. And therefore not the art of living. That's the, that's the challenge of mankind with itself. We can have the most beautiful philosophies and case is one of the greatest teachings ever. And we can be masters of it, but we know that the challenge is actually to perceive the reality of what he's pointing to. And that's why the word is helpful. I, I don't doubt it for a moment, but what is really transformative where the learning takes place is in the actual contact. That's why perception takes precedence over all knowledge. And knowledge may be significant to express that perception, but it's itself secondary. Now that's the bigger thing, see? And as you said, you see, my little attempt to, to make a summary of dialogue, um, I sort of, following a certain tendency of mine to structure things, I mentioned four pillars and so on. And indeed, I think, you see, it took me a while to understand that actually what was working properly in dialogue was perception, was sensitivity, was attention. That in fact, it was not just the work of thought, but it was the awareness of, broader awareness that included thought and therefore allowed thought to be seen. Thought has some kind of blindness in it that doesn't allow it to perceive itself. But this is the exercise also of dialogue. That's why dialogue is important, at least from the, the, the school of thought that I come from, <laughs> the Bohmian <laughs> little line, right, of an attempt to say, can we together as human beings, since we're all sharing in the same consciousness, come together and face this issue of fragmentation, which is inbuilt in our thoughts, is, in, is, in, in, is, is brought about by the very fragmentary nature of our thinking. And as we talk, that fragmentation will manifest itself. And are we attentive enough? Do we have the enough courage <laughs> to face that division, stay with it so that we get past it? We get past our opinions because relationship is much more important than my thought or your thought. than my conclusion and your conclusion that those are actually the danger, <laughs> right? So look, is a big challenge even to communicate with another. And that's also part of this art of living. Communication is to bring across the meaning and share it together. And without proper communication, there is no real cooperation. And that's the nature of the art of living. If we don't cooperate, we can't really solve our problems. So that's why I put it also <laughs> as the fourth pillar of my art of living. You see, Krishnamurti usually just mentions three, but I brought the fourth in because at Brockwood, he was very emphatic that we should learn the art of questioning, the art of thinking together. So I didn't want to neglect that aspect either. And particularly since at Brockwood, we developed this very notion of dialogue as one potential field in which all of us, humanity, could participate, take part as engaging with this very issue and see together whether we can transcend it and therefore create the ground of cooperation and understanding of freedom, therefore, from all those factors of fragmentation. So it's a very beautiful exercise. Yeah. So I'm not sure I answered the questions because it was very complicated, but <laughs> at least I hope I added a little more to your own perception, which is what matters. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. I think that Harsha Parikh wants to say something. Yes, sir. <coughs> Yes, are you able to hear my voice? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Javier. I am really amazed at the way how words are coming so beautifully in a proper order when you are speaking. So, and you are speaking more in a very general way about the problems of humanity, 
about the disorder and violence and confusion and so on. Uh, but I will speak a little bit about how I feel about this uh, seeing, listening, and uh, learning and living. Uh, I too did not know what was going on inside me. Um, thoughts were coming, going, but I wasn't very curious. But only after I read a book of Krishnamurti and what he said seemed very amazing. And I began to be very curious to look at the thinking process, how these thoughts are coming. And uh, it really, maybe I read it properly, you can say that I was not thinking about what Krishnamurti was saying, but looking directly at my, at my own mind. And uh, that really began to uh, change a different way of looking happened in my life. Before I was looking at a tree, but it was just a tree, a word. But then I began to look at the maple trees and the lake and the swan moving very gently and everything was so beautiful. Uh, so when our mind slows down and then we can really see everything fresh in a new way. And the same way with listening, though I read Krishnamurti books for five, six years, and I listened to him in Ohio in 1977 and 78, but it was only in 1979, I listened to Krishnamurti without any effort. And it was so much silence. And in that I saw something on the face of Krishnamurti so it was something very amazing. So there is a different way of listening in which there is no effort involved and we can really listen to the essence behind the words. So there is much that we can uh, discover, learn. I feel that I did not have any dialogue with people for seven years but I was just reading a little bit of Krishnamurti and looking within and I found that yes, how beautifully Krishnamurti sees everything, the way he describes in the commentaries on living, the description of nature. And then from nature, he goes to his own self and some marvelous things he uh, writes about love in relationship, so, and then a dialogue starts with some uh, people one-to-one. -one. It's marvelous, this commentary on living. It can open up a, a new way of uh, living, looking, listening, learning. And uh, what happens, I feel that when we go to school and college and learn so many subjects, we lose that sense of looking. I know that one little girl about two years old, she was looking at the full moon and she was very smiling and telling everybody to look at the moon. She did not even know what that thing was called, but her looking was very, very fresh. And then her older sister, she was about seven, eight years old. She was going to a school and during Diwali time, there were firecrackers going on in the sky with a very beautiful pattern. And I called that girl and said, look, this beautiful pattern in the sky, a very colorful pattern. And she said, oh, haven't you seen it before? And she went away. So I think that is what happens, that we get used to the knowledge and then a mechanical way of looking listening, learning, and uh, in that there is no love, no beauty, nothing. But when we really begin to 
look at our own self very non verbally clearly with curiosity with attention with energy and feel that this is the most important thing to do in life then becoming some uh, engineer or doctor so this is lacking i think in most human being that kind of curiosity to turn the attention inward and then when there is some clarity happens that there clarity comes in our way of looking at the world also uh, we can understand other human beings uh, when we understand ourselves very clearly otherwise this dialogue it can become a kind of an argument and my idea against your idea and i have seen that enough in krishnamurti circles where people sometimes get very emotional about what they feel and they not able to listen so this art of dialogue is wonderful if there is a space within us to really uh, look listen learn otherwise dialogue can become uh, very um, disorderly it can create more problems Mm -hmm. and i have seen it even in ohio and brockwood park that people in the staff meeting also people get very emotional and so one has to start with oneself in aloneness uh, initially and with great curiosity and when there is some clarity comes mm -hmm. then we can relate with people in a proper way with and if there is any conflict coming in relationship we uh, immediately sense it and that kind of ongoing effortless awareness is what krishnamurti teachings are about and once it happens then everything happens without effort even if you work very hard you don't feel that you have done any work so okay i have said enough thing thank you very much no thank you thank you <laughs> dr parekh yeah i couldn't i, I couldn't agree more <laughs> thank you thank you ashwad bhai i think there are quite a few people who want to ask mm -hmm. questions yeah. i'll request uh, everyone to be, be kindly be very brief yes mr dinesh wagmare are you able to listen to me sir yes sir mr avia yes I, yes i have um, listen your uh, lecture today and my views are your main the lecture was mainly focused on order and disorder mm -hmm. but uh, what uh, my views are order and disorder are polarities similarly fragmentation you talked about fragmentation you talked about conflict they are also nature of mind and uh, this the so called disorder which we are talking is basically caused by the individuality individually i am different from you and that's why all of the the, the causation of the this is because of the individuality now even even evolution and comparison etc what we are talking they are also just part of life and essential for the development of mankind only the thing is we should not have the ill intentions etc etc now yes whatever the the solution seems to be the abandonment of self which you talked but now in relationship how to abandon the self we can just try for the win win situation or uh, you take care just take care of me i take care of you that is that is possible because there are so many varieties of individualities and uh, so many views and so many interest of various people and all that so this seems to be the best solution means in our india we say ji aur jeene do means you take care of me i take care of you <laughs> so of course what jk says transformation is a entirely different phenomena but uh, is it for the common person or common man these are the my questions so what are your views on this Hmm. Again, a complex, <laughs> a very complex uh, outlook on things. Um, yes, you can say all these things are part of life. Order and disorder is what we need. 
So that's the reality. But we're saying basically, is this disorder natural? Or it has come about through a misunderstanding of our own nature. That consciousness has failed to keep track of its own development and has developed structures which are working against it. This is Krishnamurti's diagnosis anyway, as best I can understand it, that the very notion of time, of self, and thought, as they function now in terms of self-centeredness, they are antithetical to the very intentions of relationship and order. They are the sources of disorder. In that case, it's not like they are necessary aspects of existence at all. See? That's, that's a down of view, right? Because we do have the view also, look, we do progress through these conflicts and these challenges, and this is how we have moved, uh, developed, evolved, you see? You can say, we, you look at history and you say, well, that seems to make sense as an explanation. But then you come to the core of the issue of consciousness, and you see that that explanation doesn't quite explain it. That we have the selfishness is not explained, this individuality to begin with, where you place the basic issue, well, it seems to be also a fact. But is it a fact? Or is it something that has been made by consciousness and therefore turned into a fact based on a false assumption? To what extent are we individuals? Okay, so also questions this, right? Of saying, what, what's the difference between you and me? All right. You are an Indian, I'm a European, I'm this, I was brought up Catholic, you were brought up Hindu or whatever it was. So, and then you speak this way and I speak that way. Yeah, yeah, there are all these differences and there's all that history behind us and so on. And there are differences there very much. But then consciousness, is it really different? And therefore, if it's not different, it's only different superficially in your upbringing and my upbringing in the kind of education I received, the education you received, the experiences you had, the culture you lived in, the food you ate and the food, I, <laughs> you know, all that stuff. So I don't need to go through the list, but the sense of inwardly how consciousness operates, I bet you, we scratch all that surface away, we take all those differences away, oh, and then we find the same essential human being. This is part of the beauty of K in terms of finding order, in the sense of eliminating the factors of division that are not really relevant. Our differences as so-called individuals are irrelevant when it comes to the point of dealing with the stream of consciousness and the issue of humanity of division and conflict. There we are at the same level, exactly in the same place, because your consciousness is operating on the same principle as mine. If we even can come to that point, then there is no longer an individual. <laughs> right? That's part of order. Because then we see we have eliminated already a great part of the factors of division and disorder, which is this individuality. Because we see that you and I, ultimately, in spite of all those differences, are still run by the same system of self-interest, of pleasure, fear, pain, uh, the self-image, and all that. Conditioning. The conditioning is universal. It has particularities in terms of the culture and so on, but essentially it's universal. So we have to strip layers of these differences, and then we find exactly the same thing where you and I disappear. <laughs> Because you and I are just the manifestations of this stream of consciousness that is universal for mankind. You see, if we could even get to that point of perceptiveness, of insight, we would have already eliminated a massive amount of factors of division and conflict. We already are close, one step closer to this art of living, because division and conflict is what destroys it. This is order, and that's creative. If we can keep an eye on that whole stream, we still have to go past the stream. Well, into the stream first, right? Together. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Uh, yes, Mr. Shankar, please go ahead. 
Yeah, good morning, speaker, sir. Uh, nice uh, listening to you after a long time. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, after understanding that uh, you and me, everybody is the same, because uh, we are all operating from the consciousness. Uh, uh, actually, the fact is we only see the matter around us. Uh, because of the knowledge, we call them as physical bodies, human bodies, animal bodies, trees and all. But the fact is you are only seeing the matter all around you. And uh, in the same way, the sounds you hear also, you are only hearing the sound, noise, but you are interpreting them as words, meanings, and all that. So after understanding all this, I'm unable to understand. Uh, suppose I see my wife in daily life. Um, if I see her with an image, uh, that is a disorder. Uh, if I see her as it is uh, without an image, even then I see her as a wife, uh, still there is a disorder that uh, I give a name to that uh, something called relationship, which doesn't exist. It's also production of mind. Um, uh, still, I see her as a human being. Uh, that is also, uh, that is also again, knowledge. Uh, somebody told me it is a, a human being, it is an animal. Uh, still, I see it as a, a human body. Uh, again, there's a disorder that uh, it is only a matter you are seeing it as a human body. A just born child doesn't see as a human body or an animal body. So I'm unable to understand. Okay, when I'm interacting with my wife, that's different. When, when she asks me, uh, shall I bring the breakfast? I'll say yes or no. That is different. But when I'm alone, when I'm alone in, the house, in, in my home, then uh, what should be my state of perceiving? Shall I perceive the books and walls as matter? Shall I perceive the books as books? Shall I see my body as a, my body or physical body? I'm going crazy because uh, I, I no teaching has taken me into this, uh, allowing me to help me understand how to perceive when you are alone. They told me you observe your thoughts, uh, see the faults in every thought. That all uh, is becoming boring, but because Robert Adams says, uh, you don't have to see the thought because all thoughts are false. There's no point in seeing thoughts. But I am unable. I am unable to see things as it is. Though Krishnamurti says, see them as it is. Unable to see. I'm every. I'm every time seeing through recognition only. This is wall. This is shirt. This is pant. This is flooring. This is laptop. Please help me, sir. Thank you. But <laughs> I think we're most of us in that same place. So um, we'll see if we can learn together. That's more like it. Um, but I don't understand why why it's so difficult to just observe when one is alone. I mean, you you described the, the issue I think quite clearly that there is usually some kind of concept comes in the perception, right? That's basically part of the, the essential issue. And uh, well, all right, but you see, perception has to include that. If I see that a concept is coming in, do I see even that? Because you see, we're operating with a lot of conclusions. We have also a conclusion about that. <laughs> right? When you mentioned that somebody said that all, all thoughts are false, therefore, what's the point? Well, that's a conclusion from someone else. We haven't, have we ever even seen a thought? Are we aware of how thought is functioning? Then we have conclusions about thought. We borrow them from K. We borrow them from someone else. You say, we borrow all kinds of things. See, this is part of the challenge, to find the authenticity of perception in our own lives. And that's what you're asking, right? That's what I'm asking myself too, huh? by the way. I'm in the same, same place as you are. That is, I'm, I'm alone at home. Well, first, you're in a relationship. So how do I look at my wife? My wife. There you have two words which are heavily loaded. Right, by tradition, by my desires, by my attachment, there is so much in that already. I don't care if I bring disorder or order. What I want is to learn what's my relationship, what's the relationship, how do the concepts determine that relationship, 
and distort the relationship? Can I actually see it? I'm not going to bring the conclusion of my image distorts. Do I even, am I even aware of the image? That's the first thing. Am I aware that I look at my wife with an image? And that that image has to do with the words, my wife, my. So there's a possessiveness. There is a sense of attachment already inbuilt. There is a sense of desire, dependence, uh, you name it. The experience, my, my complete uh, involvement with that, my gaining pleasure and security, comfort, a sense of beauty even, right, from the other. Hmm? To see that, to see it, don't, don't, let's not become moralistic about our own ways, but rather, can we see? How can I see how I see? That's partly really what we're saying. Can I even begin to see that I have an image and that I have self-interest and what that does in the relationship? The relationship will show it. The relationship itself has the beauty of case suggestion that this is the mirror. Now, am I able to see myself in that mirror? That's the thing. Therefore, there is never a kind of problem. See, that eliminates already the problem. The problem is to perceive. Likewise, when I'm alone. Now, <laughs> you know what the Zen, Zen people do, right? They actually deliberately kind of remove objects from their perception. They face a wall, right? So in order to just have the, not these bodies, like you say, which are, we're always watching, tree, wall, whatever, books, <laughs> thoughts, they're all labels, right? But hey, there is, but you know also those moments, don't you? And we all do, I think, when actually the word doesn't come in and you just see. But also when the word come in, be aware of the word so that there is no, we don't introduce again another division in our lives of the word versus the perception. No, there's also a perception of the word. And look, uh, just to mention about thought and the observation of thought is tremendously important. This is what we're saying, because all those labels that we bring to bear and all those images are the work of thought. That's why you have to understand it. To say that they are false is a conclusion. It's something borrowed. It is not something seen. And that's what makes the difference. If I see how I, my thoughts are interfering with perception and distorting it, distorting my relationships and my own being as a result, then that's changing, not the conclusion about it. So perception is all. So to pay attention to thought is so beautiful and significant because then you know what, what is shaping, how the past is shaping my life, how my perception is shaped by the past. See, see, and therefore misdistorted in that way. To perceive distortion is the ground of order. So I would, I would be patient, you know, if I were you, I would be patient in the sense of, don't, don't go crazy, please. When you say I go crazy, I will get a little worried, <laughs> right? Because then, then it seems that you are in a struggle with yourself, right? And, and with the, but what is the point of the struggle? See, isn't the struggle between a concept of what you should be? versus what you are. So remove what should be. Take away all these wise men out of your life. Just look, because it's your life, nobody else's. What are they doing there with their conclusions? Is your life, is your relationship with your wife, is the beauty and total immediacy of it. Huh? So don't, 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 don't borrow all these, these, these ideals. You know, that's the, that's the beauty and authenticity of your life, right? That this has, you know, you have all this beautiful background in your image now. So that's part of it, you see, to, to, to really be in contact with that and you're directly every day, take the conclusions out because they are all, there's what interfering. There's no should be, there is being and to be attentive to it so much in the moment that there is nothing else coming in. Then there is beauty. Huh? Then you'll see, your you. Wife, you'll see your wife like you've never seen her before. Huh? Because she's the universe. <laughs> because you are. <laughs> right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Uh, we'll hear Prasad, sir, now. Yes, sir, go ahead. Sir, 
you are such a beautiful speaker hmm. and uh, you you I, I i i am convinced you have such a great understanding of cake you are one of those rare people who has understood cake i am not trying to praise you but that is my impression okay but then sir one small question this is self i have i i know i am selfish i am aware of myself does it mean that the same self is there in everybody or your self as a you, you as a european your self is different my self is different i am a hindu i i have a type of self and you have like human consciousness it is the same everywhere this self also is everywhere same or is it individualized that is each person has his own self he is basically selfish so does it mean that the same self is there everywhere or is it different from person to person that is one question sir second question i want to put to you is a little personal k has never put a truth in the market why have you made your courses paid courses i am sorry to put that question no, maybe no. there are circumstances which you are aware i mean maybe yes, it's, it's, it's fair. i don't know thank you so thank you thank you well first of all i've understood k only in a certain way okay so i'm not really transformed to really understand k would be to be totally transformed in the way he meant it and i am not that i'm just a student really just like you so i share what i have understood and really a lot of questions also that i have so there's a way of sharing together in this inquiry that is profoundly human that's as far as i've gone uh, the first thing was is the self the other question is is the self the same for everybody or is it different for each individual does it change according to the culture and so on well right there is differences there are differences even within the notion of the self you can see it in the, what uh, the previous gentleman was saying about individuality right that this is how we take it this is me that is you and i am shaped by my upbringing my background and so on and by my own experiences and by my own internal what you might call it uh, tendencies or idiosyncrasies that's what you call it an idiosyncrasy it means just a private mixture out of the background from which i come so you can see that that builds all kinds of differences already i was brought up as a catholic so my god i mean what a <laughs> what a stream of conditioning that was right you merely messed up my consciousness <laughs> like all, all these conditionings mess up most people's consciousness right introduce all kinds of dualities conflicts and misperceptions right about myself so it was maddening so you can say that was not your case fortunately <laughs> or maybe it was in a different way right okay fine and you were brought up in your particular family hopefully a loving kind i was brought up in another family and so on yes those those factors are all there so cultural individual particular and they go out to make up this sense of personality right but all those factors are coming from the same ground that's what i was trying to say if you go backwards instead this builds up a kind of pyramid right it build, builds up to a, a, a creating an entity right it builds from the ground the broad ground of culture of humanity and seems to shape up in this individual so there's an individuation carrying on this is how we look at it but now take it backwards right and you go and you take this idiosyncrasy the private mixture you go down to the ground from which it came and then you see that ultimately there you and i very much meet each other your fear is still my fear your fear may be of a particular thing and my fear of another thing but that's still the same fear the structure of the search for security is the same in you as in me the requirement of of love and affection and the sense of a meaning of our lives is still the same 
goes for everybody everywhere. That's what I'm saying. That's what I, it seems, we seem to lose sight of it. We put the emphasis on the particular and we lose sight of the universal. But therefore there we lose sight also of each other as human beings. And therefore our relationship gets broken by this particularization. That's part of our fragmentation overall. So if you really begin to question the disorder that is there permeating our lives, then we have to question this identity. The difference of the self, that the self has built itself on difference, but the self can be dissolved therefore by finding what is common. And common, the common is that we are mankind. You and I are the expression of that same fundamental stream of consciousness that is common to all mankind. This is important to see because it dissolves, as we were saying, one of the fundamental factors of division and conflict. If I keep insisting on I'm being a Catholic and you insist on being a Hindu or whatever it is, then we are at loggerheads, right? Because I, Jesus, and you say Rama, Krishna, Vishnu, and I, well, 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 there we go. <laughs> That's completely absurd, you see. We, you and I are human beings alive now, and life is total and not fragmented by these backgrounds. How else can we meet? So we have to drop that whole thing. Now you ask me a personal question, and it's a fair question. So please don't, don't, don't think you are offending me in any way. Not at all. Uh, I have to answer this question. It's important that I answer it. Krishnamurti did give his teachings free and never charged for them uh, publicly. <laughs> but Krishnamurti had a big pocket behind him. He had all the big pockets behind him. And he was lucky, of course, and he didn't care for money. And I appreciate that very much. Now, I would be happy to, if I had enough money for myself to, to pay my bills, to, to not charge at all, see? And I, in fact, I do myself have certain, how you say, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't really like it. I must confess, I don't really like having to charge, but I started doing it simply because I was doing, a, did a massive work of research. And then I was trying to offer it as a, as a general course here in the Netherlands for people who were doing other courses, like, like other things like they were doing. You see, that's why I did it. Well, how I did it rather, which was, you know, people were through, they call it uh, the free schools and so on. There's an organization in the Netherlands, which gives sort of general courses for general education, general culture. And so they do, you know, I don't know, art history, the, the modern art, uh, philosophy, this and that. So I offered this course also as part of that same spectrum of inquiry into Krishnamurti because I needed to pay my bills. I'm afraid it's as simple as that. Huh? <laughs> if, if, if I had a big pocket behind me, we can I, you, can assure, you, can, I, you can be assured that I wouldn't for a moment think of charging anything because this is free, was given free for mankind. And I, look, uh, <laughs> If, if at any time I'm in that position, I will drop it. <laughs> so, all right. So, do forgive me, but it's my circumstances, yes? All right. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. We have come to the end of the talk now. And uh, I want to express my thankfulness on behalf of uh, Kashmuti Center uh, Indore for, uh, to you for sparing your time and by talking to us and a very meaningful discussion. Thanks a lot. Thank you. No, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all the very best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next Sunday, we'll have Jackie McKinley from England and uh, she'll be speaking to us next Sunday at 6 p.m. So there is a change of timing, please note. And it will be on exploring perception. So I think a part of what uh, Javier has left out, we'll, we'll talk about that. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dubey sir. Thank you, Dubey sir. Thank you, speaker sir. Thank you very much. Thanks sir. to all. Thanks to all, and hope that you will come back again, at mm. least here. <laughs> I would love to. Thank you very okay. much. I appreciate. It. We, we too love you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Same here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Modak, now you can end it. <laughs>